I would be completely thoroughly honest with the American people if I thought there was any health problem, anything that would keep me from being able to do the job. And, uh, and so, uh, well, we'll see. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I just, I think people have to just watch me. It sounds like you're running. I've made that decision. That's my intention, I think, but I've made that decision firmly yet. President Biden sure looked like a candidate this week. Let's talk about it on our roundtable. Joined by Chris Christie, Donna Brazil, the executive editor of the Associated Press, Julie Pace, and USA Today's Washington Bureau Chief, Susan Page. And Julie, let me begin with you. You saw President Biden right there. You heard Senator Schumer earlier in the program. Democrats certainly seem to be falling behind President Biden at this moment. President Biden may say he hasn't made up that decision, but at this point there are no signs that he's not running. And certainly that State of the Union was really intended not to outline a legislative blueprint for the year. He knows that that's not really going to be possible, given the House majority uh, is now in the Republicans' hands. It was really to start setting out a re-election campaign. And the centerpiece of that is both going to be looking back to his first two years, trying to make, make clear that he feels like he has a list of accomplishments that he can run on, and then also trying to make clear that he feels re like Republicans over these next two years will outline an agenda that's out of step with a lot of the country. Susan Page, big, ambitious agenda, also designed to forestall any ch any challenge from progressives in the party. Yeah, no sign of any challenge from progressives in the party. No sign of any credible challenge from any other Democrat, which takes the pressure off uh, President Biden to announce formally that he's going to run again. There is no big advantage to him doing that in February when we thought he might or maybe in March. I would look for a later announcement uh, and a clear path to renomination. And that is not the situation that Republicans are going to face. And, but uh, Donna, the Democratic establishment seems to have fallen in line behind the president. The public not there yet, not at all. It takes time to, to, to get the right groove and the, and the right rhythm. Look, the president doesn't need to announce his reelection until late fall before you know, the deadlines to get on the ballot in some of those key strategic states. This was an opportunity for the president once again to basically lay out his, his vision and to remind the American people that he has the receipts he's delivered. Now, over the next couple of months, you're going to see the president and the cabinet going all across the country, you know, basically expressing what they have accomplished. So I think the president did a good job the other night. In fact, I went home that night, Chris, and guess what? I ate something. It was really, <laughs> it was a meaty speech. Yeah. It was good. You know it. Come on, yeah, baby. I, Give I, it up to I, Joe Biden. I, I didn't eat anything. I was a little bit queasy from the speech, but <laughs> that's our different points of view. Look, he's running. There's no doubt about it. That speech was obviously a campaign speech. Um, I think the real question is, what's he do with the vice president? I mean, what we see continuously in those polls is if you think the public isn't enthusiastic about Joe Biden, they're even less enthusiastic about Kamala Harris. And with a guy who's 82 years old, one of the key questions of the 24 race is going to be, if you're voting for Joe Biden, you may be voting for President Kamala Harris, too. And how do you feel about you that? You see this come up all the time with presidents. I remember George H.W. Bush, there were questions, will he, will he dump Dan Quayle? Um, in the end, a president cannot dump the person he picked. I think this is a different situation, George. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but we've never had an 82-year-old run for re-election. This starkly puts the vice presidency in, in, in focus for people because, you know, there is, just look at the, the tables, um, the longevity tables. At if 82 to 86 years old, he's in real risk well, of, well, of not the living other, the whole The oh. other consideration, okay. of course, for, for Biden and Democrats is, you know, to, to Susan and, and Donna's <laughs> point, there's no real credible threat happening from within the Democratic Party right now. And who is the most powerful constituency within the Democratic Party? Black, women. black women. The idea that he would set Kamala Harris, the most powerful black woman in the party, aside would really, I think, anger a lot of people within his own party. Well, well, that's that the assumption moment. that she is the most powerful black woman in the party. Um, she has the highest position in the party. But when you look at the way the public views her, there are a number of other very qualified African-American women who the vice, who the president could pick. And all I'm saying is there's going to be that conversation. It's unlikely to happen, George, but because he's going to be 82 years old, that is going to be a much bigger focus than it's ever been. First of all, I'm, I'm so glad you brought up Kamala Harris because she is probably one of the most undefined human beings. She is incredible. She's standing in her own power. She has been at every step helpful to this president and getting his agenda through the United States Congress. And so while her poll numbers may not reflect her true popularity, I can guarantee you Kamala Harris will not be replaced 
on the party's ticket. And I can also guarantee you, if Joe Biden decides not to run, Kamala Harris will become the next nominee of the Democratic Party. And I, I, I don't understand why every, every time, you know, something goes down, people say, Kamala, Kamala, she is standing in her power, she's been incredible, she's been indispensable, and she's going to continue and she's to been serve invisible. as vice president. And she's oh, been invisible. I know. Look at her daily schedule every day. Every time I look at that daily schedule, the vice president has no public schedule. That's today. on weekends. Susan Page, she did, the, the vice president does appear to be trying to turn that around, at least in the last couple of weeks. She's, she's doing more events. She's obviously had uh, some problems establishing herself. But Joe Biden does not address questions about his age by dumping Kamala Harris. Thank you. He addresses questions about his age by being vigorous and energetic and by looking forward, not backward, not just taking credit for what he's done already, but talking about what he'll do in the future. Uh, dumping Kamala Harris, which I think is not going to happen, no. would not address those issues. Chris Christie, the Republican House members, at least some of them, certainly did seem to take the bait on Tuesday night. How big a mistake was that? Big mistake. Look, you know, you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to rise to the bait, and they did. A number of them did. And it was a big mistake. Look, the, the better response would have been to respond to that with laughter. Uh, if you really wanted to respond to the president saying something as ridiculous as the Republicans, because of what one Republican said, Rick Scott, which was immediately rejected by almost the, re the entire rest of the party, what they should have done was just laughed at the president then um, and moved on. The yelling and the screaming stuff, look, I think that's always bad. Um, it doesn't get you anywhere. And it gave Joe Biden an opportunity to engage them back in a way that was spontaneous that I think was probably the best part of his entire speech. Julie, let me ask you about the Chinese spy balloon. The president did not mention the balloon in the speech, only had an oblique reference to China uh, near the end of the State of the Union. But this seems to have seized our politics over the last week. It's really an unbelievable situation, and we're still over the weekend learning more and seeing more of these uh, potential episodes uh, unfolding in the U.S. and in and in Canada. I think the, the, the biggest concern here, broadly, aside from the, the individual incidents here, is what this says about the U.S.-China relationship, because this is a relationship that is uh, incredibly broken right now, but also incredibly important. China is not some second-tier country. They are a major world power. Our economics are completely tied up with them. And you do get the sense right now that because there is such a lack of direct communication happening here, that we could end up in a position where something happens and it escalates and no one really wants to find themselves. Susan, in who knew balloons were advanced technology? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although, and who knew that China was spying on us? I mean, the fact is, everybody knew China was spying on us. Everybody knows we're spying on China. But the brazenness of sending a balloon over nuclear silos, I mean, that is really quite remarkable. But our interests are not served, as Julie was saying, by a new Cold War with China. There are things we need to deal with them on, including climate change. And we need to avoid a trigger like Taiwan from really blowing up. The Congress seems to be spoiling for more of a fight. Well, I think that was the one time we saw applause from both sides of the aisle at the State of the Union. Look, uh, 40, over 40 countries, uh, supposedly that China has flown these uh, balloons uh, three times under President Trump that we didn't know about, and perhaps even more uh, than the public, uh, the State Department or the CIA. I don't know which, uh, which of the, the small alphabets will tell us the truth. But these UFOs... Uh, are they UFOs, Chris? Because no. I want to make now sure. they're well, identified. Identified. We know what they are. Well, yesterday we didn't know. We just shot it down, so we're shooting and then we're gonna figure it out. But look, I do think that they need to come come forward and tell us exactly what they know because I think the American people want to know. Chris, it is astonishing that we wouldn't be able to detect a balloon of that size. <laughs> yeah, no, we detected it. They made a, they made a conscious decision, and and the president even said this that they made a decision not to shoot it down over land. But how, but how about under President Trump as well? Did, did, did we know then and they just didn't tell the president? Uh, you know, we don't know the answers to that yet, and I think everyone's going to be interested to find out what the answer to that is, because you've had a lot of back and forth on that, um, and nobody has think, come out with anything definitive yet. But on China, look, uh, we've got to move towards decoupling with China, in my view. The, the, the fact of the matter is that they need us much more than we need them at this moment economically. Uh, President Xi's got a lot of problems over there because of his zero COVID policy, a number of other things that happened. Uh, the CHIPS bill that's moving semiconductor and other production back here to the United States. The Chinese economy is still the second economy in the world. 
ours is still the first, and we need to use our economic leverage, George, to be able to start putting pressure on these guys because obviously they've become real big misbehaviors and they need to be put back in line and we can use our economic power and should use it to do that. Before we go, we talked about President Biden. Susan Page, we're about to see a challenger to President Trump on the Republican side this week, Nikki Haley. The first of many, uh, right? Not, not even the last will he see from South Carolina, probably, with Tim Scott uh, likely to follow her. Uh, this is going to be, I think, a big and crowded uh, field, and that probably serves Donald Trump's interests. Well, if you even just look at the rules for the Republican primaries, uh, it does serve his interests. All he's going to need to do is pick off about 30 percent of the vote uh, in a lot of these states to have a pathway to the nomination. Not saying that that is necessarily the outcome, but that path definitely remains open for him. It sounds if, if, if Julie and Susan are right, Chris, it sounds like the Republican Party has not learned the lessons of the last war. Yeah, I don't think they're right. Um, I don't think this is going to be a big crowded field. I think it's probably going to be half of the field that I was in in 2016. I think it'll be seven or eight people. Um, and that'll be at the beginning. And that may winnow a little bit more before you get to, for us, Iowa and New Hampshire. Um, I think it's seven or eight people. Um, and, and you see the absence of almost anybody except for Tim Scott in the United States Senate. It seems like almost the entire Republican side of the United States Senate saying, we'll take a pass. And what it's going to be is a field of Donald Trump, I think, current and former governors, and maybe one senator. And Ron DeSantis at the head of the pack. Well, I don't even want to talk about him this morning. That was for the, the rest of my day. But, you know, the interesting thing about Nikki Haley is she's going to make a generational argument, similar to what Sarah Huckabee Sanders uh, made in her uh, rebuttal to uh, Joe Biden. I don't know if Donald Trump is going to attack her the day before, which is Valentine's Day or the day after, but... Clearly, he benefits from a large field. And the one thing I've read over the last couple of days that interests me is that the big donors in the, Dem uh, in the Republican Party, they're now showing him the cold shoulder. So this may be Donald Trump's week to regret that he put his hat in the ring so soon. Chris, you said in the past that it, would be, it was a mistake to be the first person out of the gate against him. Yeah, I, I still agree with that. I, look, um, I don't think there's any rush to do anything here. And I think the reason you haven't seen this, think about where we were in 2014. Uh, yeah. Jeb Bush announced in December of 2014, and everything accelerated from there. I, I don't think you're going to see that. I don't think you see this field fully formed until June of this year, and then it'll probably be fully formed. And I think most people will wait until April to June to make that ultimate announcement, even if in their own mind they may have made a decision. Donna, Chris said you know, Iowa and New Hampshire are still up front for the Republican Party. Of course, President Biden wants to change the Democratic schedule. You're involved in all that. But this is not a foregone conclusion that he's going to get the calendar he wants, is it? Well, we gave uh, New Hampshire and Georgia a, a few more months to uh, put forward their uh, their plan, but I think the, the schedule that we approve is a, is, is a schedule that will stay in place. It may not include all of the states, but we're going, uh, South Carolina will be the first state. Well, and that's a schedule that lines up very well for President Biden. It's, it's one he wants, no question about that's that. That's just an accident, <laughs> I support He it. hasn't decided. <laughs> Thank you all very much.